The economic crisis has touched all levels of society, even the luxury goods sector. So what's being done for revival here? What's the outlook for the sector? And what tools are being deployed to retain old customers and cultivate new ones? Well, here with us today are INSEAD Assistant Professor of Marketing, Andrew Stephen. Hi. Good to see you. And Frederic Godard, who's a postdoctoral researcher in organizational behavior, and you're both involved in the luxury goods industry from different ways. And Frederic, I'm going to start with you because you've been covering this sector for a while. When we're talking about luxury goods, we're also talking about subsectors, sub fashion, watches, perfumes, jewelry. Yes. Which of these, I'll start with the negative, which are doing worse? Fashion and, le and leather goods is, is doing very well. So if you can, uh, if you look at Louis Vuitton, for example, they just uh, disclosed a, a double-digit growth uh, rate, which is quite amazing. Uh, now, if you look at uh, watch and jewelry, they're not doing as well. So, for example, uh, Swiss exports in watchmaking were down uh, slightly more than 20% last year. If you look at uh, wines and spirits, they're not doing well uh, either. Now, is that in a particular area of the world, some of these statistics? I would imagine North America and Europe are down more than Asia. Europe, uh, the U.S., Japan were very uh, badly hit, especially in the luxury sectors, uh, by this crisis. However, China is doing extremely well, uh, so I guess we'll speak about that later, but uh, China is really the future of the luxury industry. Andrew, in terms of trying to, to get customers to continue buying, what are luxury good companies doing? Are they using online? That's your specialty. Well, I mean, traditionally for luxury companies to retain existing customers, it's always about the, the after-sales service. You can call it customer relationship management. You could call it whatever you like, but basically it's getting customers to remain engaged with the brand, to continue loving their products, to tell their friends about these products, and of course, ultimately to come back to the store and, you know, buy the next product. Um, now, you know, with the downturn, maybe that that time between purchases is sort of, you know, widened. Um, but the, the companies are still doing sort of what they've always done in terms of, you know, identifying their top customers, really trying to make sure they're happy, that they like the brand, they're communicating with, with other people about the brand. Um, and then where we're sort of starting to see experimentation is then sort of using social media uh, platforms and, and, and tools and technologies to sort of augment the sort of the offline uh, approaches that, that these brands are taking. But it's still sort of early stages in terms of sort of this experiment engaging with customers using social media. I would think too, uh, when you think of luxury brand buyers and maybe luxury department stores, um, and they tend to be a little older crowd, and they're not going to be sitting there with their BlackBerry. But maybe, maybe they are. You know, the baby boomer generation is is getting on Facebook in droves, uh, and and so there's definitely uh, interest in the major social media technologies like Facebook, Twitter, um, and of course, you know what, what's been around even longer, like blogs and and online discussion forums, and so. Uh, the older consumer, sort of more middle-aged sort of consumer who's traditionally been the, uh, the lifeblood of these brands' revenues, um, is getting interested in, in getting online and using th these technologies. So uh, there's actually interest on that front, but of course also to, to get the sort of the, the customer of the next generation, um, obviously the younger people, the under 30s, uh, using these technologies as part of their daily lives. And so that's really where the luxury companies are sort of thinking, well, we need to figure out how to reach these you know, this large growing, um, you know, segment that maybe now isn't going to buy, you know, the uh, the really, really expensive Birkin bag from Hermes, but, you know, maybe they'd buy a wallet or maybe they'd buy a scarf or maybe they'd buy, um, you know, sunglasses from Chanel or, or whatever it might be, but sort of those entry level, uh, lower price point products um, sort of typically is the way into the brand and social media can reach these younger consumers who, who the brands want to get in now. Frederick is sitting there agreeing. Let, let me just ask, there was something called e-luxury about 10 years ago. What happened to that? LVMH was one of the first groups to try to uh, build an online platform to sell uh, luxury goods. So they started like around 10 years ago. Uh, recently, they closed down this, uh, this operation. Uh, and what they've done is like they redeployed uh, their online uh, platform to the different fashion houses and different houses in different businesses so that they don't do it at the group level anymore. Uh, E-commerce is becoming a priority for all the big groups in uh, the luxury industry. So, And so what are people buying online? I mean, some things, Andrew mentions a, a Birkin bag that you probably wouldn't, but e even even sunglasses, you need to try them on. Actually, it's, uh, it's a major challenge for all the luxury segments. Uh, if you think about watchmaking, for example, 
uh, where a 5,000 uh, euro watch is considered mid-range. Uh, I doubt uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, the I mean, online platforms are going to work very well for this kind of products. Uh, however, like websites like Watch Avenue uh, uh, are doing quite well with, uh, you know, up to up to this price, up to 5,000. I think that's, that's what they can do for the watchmaking uh, industry. There used to be a sort of a price break point of about a thousand dollars. I'm going to say because the euro was was um, equal with the, the dollar at about that time. That that um, luxury goods dealers used to say, okay, that's kind of the distress, discretionary income level. Do, are you noticing a particular price point for online purchases? It's more categories. It's more about the the, the type of consumer. So um, a more sophisticated luxury buyer, you know, luxury consumer. Um, is probably going to have a higher price point threshold at which they'd still say, okay, you know, I'm going to buy this, this, this product online. Um, so the, the other thing I think with sort of the e-commerce strategies used by the luxury houses is that uh, the websites or the web stores are, are also a lot about uh, educating the consumer. So it's about providing product information. And what a lot of the brands tend to find is that customers will come into the store with a printout of the product that they're interested in from the website and they've read about it on, uh, you know, the, the the brand's website. They've they've uh, they know the price, or the, at least they have a sense of the price range, um, a sense of the sort of options that maybe might be available in terms of different leathers. You might get the the purse in, or whatever it perhaps might be. Um, and then they've probably also searched around uh, and, and googled around to find out other information about the particular product. So it's a it's a much more informed consumer who's sort of using both the the in-store uh, retail channel to maybe make the final purchase, but a lot of what sort of led them to that point, sort of led the horse to water to make a drink, has been the uh, the online information. So it's sort of a bit of both. So even though we mightn't see huge amounts of purchasing going on, um, sort of through online retail channels, uh, it, that sort of it's sort of a tip of the iceberg because there's a lot of informational value that that consumers are getting through the online uh, as well that then brings them into the store. Which sectors within luxury goods are making money? I mean, it's kind of popular mythology that haute couture doesn't make money, but it's kind of the flagship. So what makes money? Well, accessories uh, make money in... Uh, what about perfumes and things? Perfumes also. Uh, but, you know, you have to understand that you need, uh, you need activities like haute couture to build a brand. Uh, also build the dream. Uh, you know, that's uh, something that LVMH uses a lot, the dream, that's what you sell to, uh, to customers. Uh, so you need this kind of, 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 uh, of activities, very creative, uh, very artistic also. It's kind of a social event, really, going into the store and all that. I mean, is that, that really can't be replaced online. No, and I mean, that's meant to be what a lot of the, the in-store experience is about. I mean, particularly for, um, you know, the major uh, luxury uh, brands. If you're spending large sums of money, you expect to get you know, commensurate service and, and personalized attention and customization and, and, and these sorts of things along with it. So a lot of that's delivered through the in-store experience, or at least that's the idea. Um, you know, sales associates, I guess, can have a bad day, and not every time you step into a you know, brand X store, you're necessarily going to get fantastic service. But that's what they're shooting for. And so this is the big challenge in sort of trying to take some of that service delivery or at least not, not maybe transfer it to an online channel, but at least you know, supplement it with, with some complementary activities online is how do you translate that great in-store service experience, that personalized treatment to what's going on online. And, and this is what I'd say you know, maybe five years ago with sort of web 1.0 where it's just websites, um, you know, that was a big challenge because it's just very static and there's information out there and, and you know, it's, but it's a one-way sort of interaction. The consumer's browsing through information, but that's it. Now where I think the, the, the opportunity lies in that with social media, you can have sort of a two-way street. You can have a two-way conversation. Consumers can be talking about brands, engaging with these brands, looking for information. Um, but then, you know, you could have uh, you know, people from MS, people from Chanel, people from uh, Louis Vuitton, whatever brand, uh, also then providing feedback and, and, and talking back to the customer through Twitter or through an online forum or an online chat or, or something that's more social, more engaging, more real time. Uh, you know, that's the technology is there now. It's being used in a lot of other industries. So that, that's the opportunity to try and try and at least have the social interaction that you do get in store. 
um, and at least take part of that and, and augment it with uh, the online activities. Do you think this could be part of a strategy to emerge from the crisis? I mean, how is that going to help? Perhaps they can't justify spending the money that they used to spend when times were good, but if they were used to spending that sort of money when times are good and sort of working on the assumption that times are going to be good again sometime down the track, then maybe that spending will come back up, provided that the customer still believes that there's value to be had in these purchases. And so the big, the big worry is if, okay, I can't afford to buy these things anymore, and then I start to realize, well, you know, my life is, is no worse off by not having these things. Um, and then suddenly that's when the spending doesn't come back. So a lot of efforts being invested in trying to keep the customer engaged, trying to really actually communicate the, uh, the timeless value in these products. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being Thank with you. us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you very much. Thanks.